We are in week number three of the parable of the sower or the parable of the uh, soil, whatever you want to call it. And we realize, we know by now that Jesus had had a tough day where he had done some miracles, where he had been accused of being in alignment with Satan, where there were all kinds of details of his day that just not uh, made it a difficult day. He was visited by his family. He was hanging out in a house. The Bible simply tells us he left the house. He went out, he got in a boat and he began to teach. So the disciples pushed him out into the water, most likely, um, you know, probably 20 or 30 feet. Who knows? They could still stand. They were likely holding the boat so that it wouldn't drift away. And he began to teach and he taught a parable on the kingdom of God, a parable that we call the parable of the sower. Now we've talked about in detail uh, the background and sort of the orientation of the parable of the sower, but there is a sower who sowed seeds, a farmer who sowed seeds. He scattered the seeds. Now the farmer is Jesus in the parable, but also anyone who shares the gospel or the word of God, you, me, uh, we are all farmers or sowers. There is the seed, which is the word of God, which we know is timeless, that never goes out and returns back void without accomplishing its purpose, God's purpose. We know that the soil that it goes into is the human heart, and we know that there's three types of responses to the word of God. There is the type of response where the seed lands on the hard heart, the beaten path, and the birds come down and take the seed away. That's what we're focusing on today. And when Jesus interpreted this parable for his disciples, he said the birds can come and steal the seeds of the gospel of the word of God from a heart. And that that's the same thing that Satan does. Satan himself will come and steal the seed of the gospel or the word of God from a heart before it can penetrate. And you and I, there's some things we can do to help contribute um, to uh, not allowing that to happen. Because even on a Sunday morning like this, when the word of God goes out, regardless of the skill or lack of skill of the sower or the farmer, the person sat, uh, scattering the seeds, the word of God is powerful. And when allowed to settle in a person's heart and the person responds, can change lives. And so if there's a spiritual war, or since there's a spiritual war that goes on anytime we get together, anytime the word is distributed, we have a responsibility or a role in that, and we have an outcome or a goal in mind. And so we're going to discuss that in the second part of our time together in about um, 30 minutes or so. But before we get there, what I'd like to do is to show you a video that Pastor Jared and I shot. We had uh, flashbacks of the COVID uh, pandemic when we shut the church down and Jared and I went on location. Even on Easter, we showed you a little bit of that, our church history. Well, we decided we were going to go out this week and we were going to film a little bit of this story, set up some background for you, lay out some things that are difficult to think about, but important as we sort of build our theology on what role does Satan play uh, in a, something like a Sunday morning service or anytime the gospel goes out, what role do we play uh, and, and reinforce the fact that God is more powerful than anything in this world. We are not more powerful than evil, but the Holy Spirit in us is far more powerful than evil. And when we line up with God's plan, we can contribute to the gospel of Jesus Christ, penetrating the hearts of people who desperately need to hear from him. So I wanna encourage you to watch this video with me. Well, here we are, not very far from the church at Kathy and Kelly Logan's home. You probably know both of them. Kathy, of course, is the administrative assistant uh, for our staff, uh, for Pastor Dan and I, and she's sort of the hub of the wheel of all the activity and organization uh, on a weekly basis at the church. Now we're here because Pastor Jared and I, we started a conversation a few days ago. Um, well, let me just tell you about it. We were talking about yards, about grass. We were talking about birds. And I told you a story uh, last week about my wife um, growing some birds, raising some birds uh, in our wreath on our back porch. They're hatched, by the way, and almost ready to leave the nest. And so Joy will be an empty nester uh, once again. But here we are, Pastor Jared and I were talking about grass and about yards, and we were talking about how much it cost to maintain your yard, to grow a great yard. And he just very innocently said, or I think it was innocent, he said, uh, Pastor Rick, I know you don't spend very much money on your yard, but, <laughs> and so I stopped him and I said, what do you mean I don't spend very much money uh, on my yard? And he quite, uh, laughed it off and, you know, he said, I know yard, yard work's not your thing. And we had a big laugh about it, but I wanted to, to finish.
film uh, today. I wanted to record a video and uh, talk to you about grass, talk to you about soil, talk to you about yards, and talk to you about birds particularly. And so, Pastor Jared, I said, your yard's beautiful. You have Samson grass, long and flowing grass, and one of the best yards in his entire neighborhood. But he said, I have tall fescue and, and, and fine fescue right now, and my yard's not ready to be a show yard. I don't want to show that to the church. And so here we are at the best yard we could find, at least the best yard on our church staff. Now, we're talking today about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 13 in the parable of the sower talked about how when the gospel is spread or broadcast by a sower, by a farmer, by somebody planting a seed, that the birds can come swoop down and steal the seed. And then in his interpretation, as you will see today, that Jesus says that Satan is like a bird swooping down and stealing the gospel from people before it has a chance to take root in our hearts. Now, that's a pretty heavy concept for us to think about. That's one of the reasons I'm out here talking to you on a location instead of just face-to-face in our worship room. In a few minutes, we'll go a little bit further, dig a little deeper and talk about how that God has called us, you and I, not to be distracted by the schemes of the devil, not to be distracted, not to cause distractions, and uh, to make sure that we're focused on what it is that we are supposed to be contributing toward this presentation of the gospel and the receiving of the gospel. But the Bible teaches us about, about Satan in very limited ways. And I think it's because God doesn't really want us preoccupied or focused on things that are evil. I think we have a choice in life, and that is that we curse the darkness or we light a candle. And Jesus was a candle lighter in a sense where he liked to talk about what was good and pure and holy and healthy, but he warned us about Satan and his schemes from time to time. Today, we're going to be talking about the devil and talking about how he never misses a Sunday. It's hard to imagine that a bird who everyone likes, or that everyone likes, including Jesus, could be um, used or compared to the devil or Satan. I mean, look at little birds here. These birds don't look very dangerous. They don't look very, um, well, satanic. And of course, Jesus wasn't saying birds are satanic. That's Stephen King. At least I think it is. Jesus even said in Matthew that the birds are protected by him and he provides for them. But let's talk for just a second about what the Bible says about Satan himself. Now we know that Satan was an angel or is an angel and that he was one of the most beautiful of the angels, that he was a worship leader of sorts, that he was a leader and one day chose to become like God. And by making that choice to be like God, he separated himself from God and God's will and was cast from heaven, banished along with angels who chose to follow him. Now, we don't know the number, but we do know that there were angels who chose to follow Satan and were cast from heaven. And we know that some of them have access to roaming the earth and um, oppressing us, even those of us who are saved. Now, you notice that I said the word oppressed, not possessed because a true believer can't be possessed by any evil spirit. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, indwells the life of a believer. We talked a lot about this on Wednesday night as we discussed salvation and eternal security, but once the Holy Spirit comes and sets up residence inside your life at the moment of salvation, He seals your salvation and possesses your soul, so you can't be possessed by any other spirit except the Spirit of God. However, we can be oppressed, and I think this oppression is what we're really getting at today. But let me read to you a story from the book of Ezekiel about the fall of Satan. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the Garden of Eden. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lupus, lazulol, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold, and on the day you created, or you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian, as an, an angel, a cherub, so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until wickedness was found in you, and you chose. Now, Ezekiel's not talking specifically and directly about Satan, but he's referring to Satan as well as some evil kings from his day. 
And we don't know a lot about the fall of Satan beyond the fact that he did in fact fall, that he was in fact judged, and that he was destined to spend his eternity with all of the evil angels, the demons who chose to follow him um, at that one day when he was cast from heaven. Uh, But what we do know is that Jesus himself said he saw the fall of Satan. In Luke chapter 7, he, uh, Jesus said, I saw Satan cast from heaven and it was like a flash of lightning. Now, he, Jesus didn't elaborate very much. It was sort of almost a parenthetical point that Jesus was making. But um, in Luke chapter 10, I'm sorry, uh, Jesus said that he saw it, he witnessed it. Now, we don't know exactly when it happened, but we do know that it was before the creation of the earth. Job 38 tells us that. We also know, of course, that it was before Adam and Eve were in the garden because in Genesis chapter 3, we see Satan showing up, trying to deceive Eve even really with the same kind of logic and the same kind of, uh, well, deception that um, he was using back in the day when he was cast from heaven in the first place. He says to Eve, is God really prohibiting you from eating any of the fruit of any of these trees in in the garden? And and what he was doing was subtly twisting God's words because God hadn't said that at all. And Eve said, no, God said, just don't eat from this one tree. And Satan said, yeah, but the reason he doesn't want you to eat from this one tree is because he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to know the difference between good and evil. He doesn't want you to have that knowledge. And so Eve latched on to the first deception by the deceiver, the destroyer, and chose to eat the apple, giving it to Adam who chose to eat the apple. And then many, 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 many years later, we still suffer the repercussions from this. Now, we know that Satan had limited access to God because in Job chapter one, we see him going before the throne and God says, in a sense, what are you up to? And he says, I'd like to, to, um, to oppress Job. I would like to do some things to Job to test his faith. And we don't know why, but God allowed it. And if you read the book of Job, you see all sorts of terrible things that Job went through, but his faith didn't falter. Now, as history unfolds, Thankfully, Jesus in his bodily form came to earth, was living a life as a man, a perfect man, 100% God, 100% man, took on the sins of the world, died on the cross, rose again three days later, defeating sin, Satan, and death, and the purposes and claim that Satan had over humanity. And when he did that, Satan's access was limited to God. And some believe that if it wasn't limited to God at that point, at least Revelation 12 teaches us that it was limited or will be and restricted at the final battle. So that brings us full circle all the way back to Jesus talking about the parable of the sower, the parable of the sower. And he talks about a person who is a farmer, a skilled farmer, and he's taking seed. And as he takes seed, he's walking through. And I asked permission to do this, by the way, and this is weed free bird seed um, broadcasting the seed. And the seed represents the gospel of Jesus Christ, the difference between death and life the difference between darkness and light. As a matter of fact, it's the truth, the founding principle of of our lives, of our church. It's the thing that changes everything. And the only decision that's going to matter at the point in time you leave this life behind, and I leave this life behind, is the decision that we made about Christ. And Satan knows that. So he does whatever he can to keep the gospel from penetrating the heart. So when the seed, the word of God is is sown by a pastor, by a teacher, by a friend, especially on a Sunday morning, Satan does his best to cause distractions, to cause us to be distractions, to deceive, to do anything he can to steal the seeds away so that they don't penetrate the heart because the last thing he wants is for your heart to be penetrated. Now, first Peter talks about the fact that our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. As a matter of fact, we're told to be alert to be on guard because we have this enemy. And and when the Bible talks about devour, it literally means to destroy, to annihilate, to, to remove everything good from your life. And so as we look at this a little further in just a few minutes, as we look at what you and I do, most of us as believers in Jesus Christ, as people who have received this gospel, not wanting to be distracted, not wanting to be a distraction, we are going to focus on some positive and proactive things that are our responsibility to do. Because after all, we don't want to be bird feeders on a Sunday or any other time. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that we aren't living and fighting in the same way that the world does. For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does because the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. 
On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the right knowledge of God. And we take captive every single thought to make it obedient to Christ. I was thinking about a time when my son Nathan and I were on the beach in California and Nathan was quite young at the time. And I bought him chicken nuggets because he loved chicken nuggets. And he still likes chicken nuggets, as a matter of fact. But I had a, a 20 pack of chicken nuggets. I had a beach blanket laid out. We were in Northern California on the beach and, and we had seagulls everywhere. And seagulls are huge. I mean, they're, you've seen them. I mean, they're, and they're aggressive. And they would swoop down and they would try to steal the chicken nuggets, which seemed a little bit like cannibalism to me, but they still wanted the chicken nuggets. And I can remember this as clearly as it was yesterday. Nate was building a sand castle. It was just the two of us. He wanted me to go down to the, to the wet sand and, and get a, a big bucket of wet sand so that we could build. So I walked down maybe 25, 30 yards down to the water and I was filling up my bucket full of wet sand. And I look back and Nathan, just a little kid, now he's 25 years old almost, but just a little kid with a shovel about that long, a plastic shovel, seagull swooping down trying to steal his nuggets and Nathan smacking them as best as he can with this. And I saw him whack one right in the beak and I thought, that's my kid right there. He'd die. Well, he thought the seagulls could kill him. I think he would die before he gave up a chicken nugget and he was willing to fight birds. Maybe that's you and I today. Maybe through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, maybe you and I can stand up in the positive and proactive ways that you'll see in just a few minutes and swat some seagulls as they try to swoop down and steal the seeds of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul planted a church in Corinth and he spent about 20 months with this church in Corinth and then left. And the church, when he left, um, like any church, began to have conflict. And there were some false teachers who came in, some people who sort of tried to make church about themselves. They started squabbling, um, throwing accusations around. It got a little bit nasty. And the Apostle Paul wasn't there, but he wrote a letter. And he wrote a letter basically saying, straighten up. There's a spiritual war going on. It's a lot bigger than any of us and we need to be alert and we need to be part of it. We need to be proactive. And so I wanna to talk to you about that real quickly. And I wanna to talk to you about what our part is on a Sunday morning to be contributors to the gospel and not to stand in the way of what it is that Jesus is trying to do. And I don't want to overwhelm you because there's a lot of stuff to say, but we're just gonna drill down to just a small piece Paul says, for though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Strongholds were fortresses that most cities had. And Corinth builds up on a hill that people knew that they could go and they could hide in if they were under attack. They were also, it was a word that was used for prisons and uh, places that people sometimes were put when they just wanted to avoid anything unpleasant in their lives. For you and I, a stronghold could be anything that sets itself up against the right knowledge of God and in our lives, all of us develop strongholds. Now, I just want to talk about a Sunday morning application because there's many things we could talk about in spiritual warfare. But I think the time the gospel goes out most of the time for us is on a Sunday morning when a pastor or um, someone else says, Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose again three days later, that he defeated sin, Satan, and death once and for all. And if you confess your sin, you believe in Jesus and choose to follow him with your life, not only will you find peace with God on this earth, but you'll find peace with God in heaven for eternity. The gospel of Jesus Christ. When it goes out, Jesus said that birds, Satan, demons, try to steal it from your mind and your heart. And so since we take Jesus literally, it means there's a spiritual war going on right now that we don't see. And the Apostle Paul is reminding us that if we're not careful, we can make church about us and we can develop our idea or philosophy of being part of the body of Christ into a stronghold that Satan can use to prevent the gospel from penetrating hearts. Now, I don't want that to overwhelm you because after all, we're instructing ourselves from the word of God. But as part of a spiritual family, it brings a responsibility to a spiritual family and I don't know about you, but when you're part of a family, me being a head of household, if anyone in my family is gonna get blessed, I want somebody else in my family to be blessed before me. 
I would rather be a blessing for my kids than be blessed from my kids. I would rather my wife be blessed than me in fact be blessed or take her blessing. And as part of a spiritual family, we have to have that same attitude and that same mindset. It's the life of uncommon faith that God put me here to be a blessing to others, that if someone's gonna get blessed, it's gonna be you, not me. And I'm gonna do my part to make sure that the word of God can penetrate your heart and that you can change and get everything that you need. Now, not everybody's gonna choose to accept that. The apostle Paul knew it and Jesus knew it, but you and I have to choose what path we're gonna take. It's not common, it's uncommon, but it's the stuff that a family of God is made of and it's the way the gospel penetrates hearts and changes lives. And so the stronghold here um, is something they would have understood visually, we understand figuratively. And uh, he says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the right knowledge of God. And we take captive every single thought we have to make it obedient to Christ. Four quick things to learn about this, uh, this passage of scripture. Number one, that we have weapons and the weapons we have are not weapons of this world, that they are divine weapons. That's point number two. And in Ephesians, Ephesians talks about the armor of God. And Paul tells us in Ephesians, we have two offensive weapons. One of those is the word of God and the second is prayer. And that's it. That for us to be part of laying down the cover fire so the Holy Spirit can penetrate the hearts with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you and I celebrate the word by being part of and allowing it to be shared. And we pray that God would protect the ears to provide insight, to prove himself true to people who desperately need to hear it. And that's your my responsibility as part of the family of Christ. If someone's gonna be blessed, it's gonna be you, not me, and I'll go to war for you by praying for you so that you get what you need. And by the way, by doing that, that's how God blesses me and gives me what I need as well. And so we see they're not weapons of this world and we have two offensive weapons, prayer and the word. Let's move on. They're not uh, weapons of the world, but they, they also have divine power. They're associated with the correct knowledge of God and their purpose in warfare is to make sure we're thinking the right thoughts. When I was a college pastor back in the day, my first full-time church job, ministry, um, we had an interim pastor and I didn't like him. He was old. Now I was 28 years old at the time. He was probably 50. Um, I'm 53 now. He was old. He was boring. Um, this was a big church, thousands of people. We were on TV, made you wear suits and match your socks and all kinds of stuff. A lot of, it's a different world. And, uh, we just kind of made fun of the guy. Shouldn't have, we did. So boring. I don't get anything out of his messages. Blah, 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 blah. And, um, one of my friends had to stand up and read scripture and pray before the service or before the sermon. And it was on TV with thousands of people and he had a new cell phone. And this was back in the day when we didn't have cell phones. This was like bag phones became bricks. Then they became phones you could put in your pocket or wear on your belt, which is what he had done. And no one taught him how to mute his cell phone. And so he was up there and I called his cell phone from the very back, sitting on the back row. And his cell phone went off. His name was Chris. He's probably still mad at me. And at first he kept trying to read scripture while his cell phone was ringing. And it was one of those weird rings that everybody liked to choose back when weird rings were cool. And um, he started trying to keep reading and he couldn't keep reading. So he got flustered and started whacking his pocket like this, trying to get his phone. And you can't sil silence your cell phone by whacking the cell phone with your hand. It doesn't work. Um, and then finally he takes his cell phone off, the clip and everything. And he walks down to the front row and hands it to somebody um, so that he could finish doing what he was doing. Now you may think it's funny, uh, I got called into the executive pastor's office and um, they said, did you really do this? And I was like, yeah. And he said, why? Uh, and I said, because I didn't feel like God was going to do anything anyway in that service. And so I thought I would have a little bit of fun. How bad could someone's attitude and expectation be for you to say, I didn't think God was going to do anything anyway. So I thought I'd have a little fun. Now I didn't get fired although I might should have been fired, 
But what my boss told me was, who are you to decide what God's going to do and what he's not going to do? The word of God goes out and never returns void without accomplishing God's purpose, regardless of how boring the speaker is. If you're not getting anything out of it, it's a heart problem, not a word problem. And so there's some things that we have to do to demolish the strongholds in our life to where we come to a gathering of believers with expectation that God is going to do anything because today could be the day where everything changes. And it may not be for you. You might be fine, but it could be for the person behind you, next to you, in front of you, somebody you've met, somebody you don't even know. But we as members of a spiritual family want the other person to be blessed, even if it means we miss a blessing. And even if we don't feel like it. And one of the things that Satan uses to steal the power of the gospel, where it doesn't penetrate the heart, is distraction. Distractions oftentimes start on Saturday night. Because for us to be present and to participate and to be part of this body, we have to be here. And isn't it interesting how sometimes, even if we've planned to show up, things happen. Coincidentally, the kids start fighting. Something pops up that we're going to go do that we never thought about going to do. And somehow we just don't make it to the battle. Intentions. And the road to hell is paved with good ones, right? One of my sons, won't tell you which one, growing up, learning how to be an adult, just like I guess we're all still trying to do. He said, um, you know, this last year, my goal was to save money. And I said, well, how'd that go? And he said, well, it didn't go as well as I thought. And I said, why not? And he said, well, I didn't save as much money as I wanted. And I said, why not? And he said, because I guess it wasn't a priority. I must not have planned well enough. But the intention was there. And he would have told you that it was very important for him to be able to stack up some cash for him to achieve his goals. But since it wasn't a priority and he didn't plan accordingly, it didn't happen. And in a sense, didn't show up to the fight. And Paul says, it's a spiritual war and you can sit on the sidelines if you want to. It's your prerogative. But he's calling for soldiers. And Paul uses the war metaphor and and military and soldier analogy all the time. I'm looking for men and women who will come and be part of the battle and lay down the cover of fire, the prayer for the word of God and the hearts of people who want to be part of the blessing and not just receive the blessing. It also means that we have to decide that it's not all about me in my experience and how I feel and even how people treat me or whether I'm comfortable. Isn't it interesting how distractions can totally take you and your focus off of the word and what's happening and put it somewhere else. I can be sitting in a group just like this and somebody can irritate me and they're not even doing anything. I just don't like the back of their head. It's weird looking. Or somebody's moving their foot a little bit and at first you don't notice and then all of a sudden all you can think about is them tapping their foot or chomping their gum. And instead of thinking about what we should be thinking about, All we're thinking about is how everybody's irritating us and we can't wait to get gone. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Screwtape Letters where it was a master demon training a a demon underling and um, talking about how to distract people. And uh, the instructions were really simple. He said, look, don't go for the things that people aren't used to. Go for the areas where you have the most influence and control in someone's life. He said, when someone's listening to the word, when they're tracking with the service, when the things are happening, just suggest lunch. And right now I say the word lunch and you might not have been happy until I said, or hungry until I said it. And now you're thinking about lunch. And instead of thinking about the word and the people around you, you're wondering, where am I going to go? Is there going to be a line? When do they close? I hope they have. And so we're distracted and it's a battle for our minds and for our focus and for a correct and right knowledge of God. And I think the next thing we have to be careful of is that when we're distracted, we don't become distractions. I have distracted my wife before from spiritual things because my head wasn't in the right spot and my heart wasn't tuned in. 
And so I would elbow her, show her things on my phone, tell her a joke, point something out, and rob her ability to connect with the word. Some of you may do the same thing from time to time. And when asked, you may say, I didn't really expect anything good to happen. I didn't really expect God to move. So I thought I'd just have some fun. And then instead of being a bird defeater, we become a bird feeder. As Satan swoops down and steals the seeds from the hearts of the people. You don't see many messages on this part of the parable because it's really difficult to dive into. And many of us don't think we signed up for this kind of a spiritual battle and to be part of it. But Paul and Jesus, more importantly, says not everyone's going to be part of this because some of you just don't want it. You're just going to be stuck with the milk. Remember last week? You want the things that make you feel good. You want to turn the Bible into a greeting card. But the second it becomes a little difficult to choose to be that blessing instead of receive that blessing, there's some who are going to stop, but there's some who are going to go to war. And that's what we're going to do. I will go to war with you and for you. And I want you to go to war for each other because it's a spiritual war. And Jesus laid it out there. So you and I, we get to choose. So what I would like to do as we close is to pray for you. And I want to encourage you. You might be fine, but the person in front of you or next to you, behind you, even the person who came with you may desperately need to hear from God right now. And just because you don't know it doesn't mean you can't be a proactive part of it. So pray for them. Use the weapon that the Holy Spirit has given you. Pray for God to be Lord in their life. For the Lord's voice to be clear. For their hearts to be soft. For their lives to be changed in whatever way you feel impressed to pray. And if you don't feel impressed to pray for them in a specific way, pray for them the way you would want somebody to pray for you. We really had to deal with this and this subject because we couldn't go any further and finish it up next week until we looked at the powerful way that Jesus himself introduced the idea of the spiritual war related to entrance into the kingdom of God and opening his arms saying, will anyone do battle with me? Pray for the people who are around you as I pray for you and we prepare to leave. Father, thank you for my friends. And for any of those who may be struggling, who may need encouragement, who may be feeling a little lost, looking for answers, for those perhaps brand new in their faith, looking to learn, for those who've been around a long time and think they know it all, I pray that we would have a reality check, a heart check. That we would die to self, acknowledging the reality that it's not about me. Committing to you that we will be a blessing instead of demanding to be blessed. I pray for the people who are around us today, Father. Any who need to hear the truth of the gospel to give their lives to you to confess their sin, to believe who Jesus is and pledge to follow you as both Savior and Lord. I pray that that message would settle in their heart and that Satan would not steal it, that your Holy Spirit would penetrate the soil of the soul, the heart of their life, and that your gospel would be received and take root and grow. I pray for our church that we would be full of a group of people willing to do battle for each other, to celebrate the word, to lay down the cover fire of prayer, to usher in your power 
Father, as we celebrate your presence among us. We love you and we thank you for for choosing us to be part of this, for this great parable and for this timeless truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.